in a world where Microsoft virtualization is still considered to be the underdog by some. The Hyper-V Amigos enlighten the IT crowds on how they could very well be mistaken. Hello and welcome to the first episode of the Microsoft Hyper-V Amigos podcast. My name is Carsten Achfall. I'm a German-based Hyper-V MVP in the fifth year already and I'm not quite new to podcasting. Um, I'm doing three different podcasts in German of course and uh, if you are a German listener or you can understand German maybe you want to have a look at them. One is the Microsoft Virtualization podcast where I talk about uh, all the great private cloud stuff Microsoft is doing and a little bit about hybrid and I've done already I guess about 47 niche uh, episodes here so I'm doing podcasts quite for some time maybe five years or so then I to do I, I do two more podcasts with my wife Kerstin Rachfa. Kerstin has two personas one is she is an office 365 MVP and we do the Himmlische IT podcast together and then her her, her main passion is being an author so we do another podcast it's it's quite different it's it has nothing to do with IT it's about it's a Buchgeflüster and it's about her journey as independent self publishing author so um, this is my podcasting and I do some other things uh, for example with Didier van Hoyer the Hyper-V Amigo showcast where we uh, try to demonstrate uh, in, in, in Skype sessions the great private cloud stuff from Microsoft and if you found this video it's published on the website www. Hyper-V-Amigos.net. Uh, this site is also the home of this podcast, and I do also video interviews with um, with guys I meet, guys and girls I meet uh, in the Microsoft private cloud area. And uh, videos is great. I love to do videos. The problem is only you have to have your camera with you with you and a microphone and you have to meet in person to do a video interview where you can talk to someone else on camera so i decided why not doing a podcast uh, using skype for for interviewing people and this is much much easier i will not stop doing the video interviews uh, but uh, i try to do a podcast every month or so so this is my intention to do this podcast and of course I do it in English because many 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 other uh, private cloud people uh, don't speak German they speak other languages and uh, the language we speak all a bit more or less is English so we do this in English but this is enough of me let's come to the interview uh, I'm very very proud to do my first interview with Ben Armstrong Ben Armstrong also known as uh, the virtual PC guy and for me Ben is Mr. Hyper-V why is that? Ben is principal program manager lead in the Microsoft Hyper-V group and he is doing Hyper-V from the start. Uh, he even started before there was Hyper-V with virtualization but he will tell us this in the podcast and um, so let's don't waste time let's start with the interview and I'm very proud to have Ben Armstrong for you. So hi Ben how are you? Hi Carsten I'm good. <laughs> Ben, uh, you know you're one of my heroes and I'm very proud to have you on my first English podcast. Uh, I'm uh, I, excited to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited too and uh, I'm very thankful that you make the time to do this podcast with me. So Ben, please introduce yourself. Uh, uh, I know a lot of people know you because we are talking about Hyper-V, but maybe you will tell the other guys who you are. So yes, I'm, I'm Ben Armstrong, I'm program manager on the Hyper-V team. I've been working on virtualization now for about 15 years and uh, most people know me as Virtual PC Guy. 
Um, that's where I blog, that's where I tweet, and really fun point, you can actually now email me virtualpcguy at microsoft.com. Okay. Uh, I got that all set up. So if anyone emails virtualpcguy at microsoft.com, um, it, it'll get to me. Um, and what I like to say these days is, you know, having worked in this area and on this code base for so long, there's a, a, a real pro and a con. The pro is if you have any questions about Hyper-V, about virtualization, about containers, I probably know the answer. Uh, the con is, if there's anything you don't like about Hyper-V, it's probably my fault. <laughs> I have some questions for the, for you, so I will come <laughs> back to the faults or what's yeah, yeah, great absolutely, about absolutely. Uh, Hyper-V. But before that, um, you are a principal program manager, and I assume there is another, there's a lead in there. So my yes. first question, question would be, what is, what is the principal program manager lead doing? What is your day job? So first, that's I'd like to say that's my full fancy title. Yeah. I, I tend to stick with I'm a program manager. So uh, so I, I work on the Hyper-V team, and I actually manage a team of program managers. Um, and our job collectively um, is to work with customers, to work with the industry, to work with software partners, and try and figure out what we need to be building next and then as we're we're working on a release it's the program manager's job to obsess about is what we're building good enough it does it meet the customer need you know is this going to be a good release um, so we spend a lot of time thinking about customers talking to customers and then working with the development teams to try and deliver something that makes people like you happy <laughs> <laughs> great job and you have done a great job there i'm very happy with the product so but hyper-v is not alone uh, it it it's it's embedded in other software like you have to work absolutely. with a lo lot of other teams right absolutely we spend a lot of time and one of the the fascinating things about microsoft is we have a lot of teams inside microsoft and more of like a lot of people come to Microsoft and they think that it's going to be you know a very strict hierarchy with lots of bureaucracy and it's actually a much more collaborative environment mm -hmm. you know we spend a lot of time kind of negotiating back and forth between the teams and trying to come up with end-to-end -end scenarios uh, and it's lots of fun you know for example uh, in uh, in the upcoming Windows Server 2016 uh, there are some awesome features uh, for Hyper-V um, that I know that my users are going to look at and go like, hey, it's great that we have that feature for Hyper-V when that feature was done by the clustering team or that feature was done by the networking team. And, and it's, you know, it's a fun environment. Not to say we don't have our moments of dis a disagreement, uh, but it's, it's lots of fun when it all comes together. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of collaboration going on between the groups. That's that's great. Mm -hmm. And uh, you said it, clustering. There are some great features. Storage. There are great features. Yes. Uh, yes. Networking. Super, super excited about some of the storage stuff that's coming out too. So happy to see Storage Spaces Direct yeah. coming to market. And even I think Azure is a big part where you oh, yes. Uh, yes. collaborate with, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, I have a question for you, and I was thinking a little bit what to ask uh, Mr. Hyper-V, because you are for me the Mr. Hyper-V. So I, uh, I wrote something down, and um, one question I have for you is, what is a feature that you worked on that was the one you are most proud of? Ooh, that is a tough one. Um, you know, keeping in mind that I've, I've worked... On, on a lot of features. I've worked on Hyper-V forever. Um, what is the feature that I've worked on that I'm most proud of? Um, you know, as I said, this is a really tough one. There's a yeah. long, okay. long list. Um, you know, I'm going to say, um, and I'm going to cheat because I'm going to say one feature, which I then get to roll like three or four features under. Okay. Uh, I'm going to say the feature is live migration. Um, I guess that. I guess that. Yeah. <laughs> when you said you know, three or four features around. Yeah. It. Yeah. So 
you know, the to, to kind of give the, the full history of live migration uh, um, and to give a bit more background that most people, in fact, I would guarantee 99.9% .9 of people in the world are unaware of. Um, we actually came up with the idea for live migration, and we got we got the patent for this. So we can, I can go back and historically prove this. Uh, we came up with the idea for live migration uh, in late 2000. Mm -hmm. Actually, no, in 2001. Oh, that's in 2001, 14 years. 14 years ago, 2001, when I was working at Connectix, uh, the company that uh, Microsoft acquired for virtualization. Uh, there was a small group of us um, who sat down and like brainstormed and we said, you know what, like it's a crazy idea but this should be possible. Um, and we actually, we drew out the architectural diagram for live migration and uh, we filed the patent. Um, and if you want to shoot me an email afterwards, I'll give you a pointer to the, the patent that we got okay. uh, in 2001. I will add that in the show notes so you will yeah. get the mail. Uh, so uh, we, we filed the patent for that in 2001, and it was always something uh, that we wanted to do. Um, when, we, when we started working on Hyper-V, uh, we, we really wanted to do live migration. And we actually found uh, a fellow uh, working at a university in Germany who had done a PhD uh, on live uh, on a similar concept to live migration, uh, we hired him and brought him over to the states to be like, right, you like you have to make this happen. Okay. Uh, and the the really funny thing for us was when we you know we came up with this idea at Connectix, and uh, when we started working on it at Microsoft, there were a whole bunch of people around us at Microsoft saying, yeah, that's never going to work. Okay, <laughs> um, and and we had to really stick to our guns and be like, no, no, we believe that that this is possible and that this is doable. Uh, and the first time we got live migration working uh, was really awesome, really exciting. Um, but above and beyond that, uh, the the reason why I had to choose live migration was, of course, the first time we got live migration working was great. Um, but then. We followed that up with shared nothing live migration. Yeah. Uh, that was a huge, huge achievement. You know, being able to to move an entire virtual machine between two physical boxes with no shared infrastructure. And when we did shared nothing live migration, that was an industry first. You know, because up until that date, uh, that point in time, any live migration, you needed to have huge amounts of infrastructure. Uh -huh. And then, of course, the, the work that we did in 2012 R2 around faster live migration. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the, the story I have to tell here, because I always, I always have to tell this story, is, you know, we, coming into 2012 R2, we were looking at what our customers were doing, we were looking at pain points, and, like, one of the things that we were starting to hear from the larger deployments is, hey, live migration takes too long for doing, like, large-scale patch and servicing and so on. Um, and we started, and we'd actually, uh, we'd actually had some intern projects done where they'd prototype different approaches, and so we had some data and we had some ideas to go on. Um, and we, we, had, like, we had the idea of doing live migration compression. And we'd, we'd done an intern project on that. And so we had a good feel for like, hey, we should be able to do this, and this should get us three or four you know, times short of live migration, yeah. and that's great. And as we were discussing this, we actually had um, some of the guys in the Windows Server hardware ecosystem team, you talked about collaboration and so on, um, come to us and say, hey, Hype Free Team, we, we heard you're looking at faster live migration. You should really look at RDMA. And like this, this bit, it. so this bit, like the bit I'm about to say, you're just going to laugh all the way. Um, when we started looking at RDMA, no one on the Hyper-V team, myself included, actually believed it was going to work. Okay. <laughs> we, 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 like, we, like, we're looking at this piece of technology for RDMA, we're looking at the concept of live migration, and we're like, 
we don't see how these two things fit together. They're different protocols, they're different hardware, they're designed to solve different problems. Like, and when we started on doing live migration for RDMA, um, one, we, uh, we were really doing it more or less as like, hey, you know, they want us to do it and it's a nice thing to do and we have the engineering bandwidth and we don't know if it's going to pan out or not. But like, like sh sure, let's go explore this and let's find out. Yeah. Uh, and the second thing, and I can actually dig up this document. I can't share it. It's an internal Microsoft document, but I can dig up this document. I look back at it and laugh. Uh, was, you know, I have part of being a program manager is when we're working on performance related features, you know, like foster live migration, I have to come up with the bar for like, what goal do we have to hit in order for this to be good enough for the customer? You know, like, you know, where, where's, where's the acceptable performance spot? Uh, and so I had, a, I had a bunch of data for uh, live migration with compression, you know, and I'm like, look, you know, ideally we want it to be four times faster, but if it's at least twice as fast, that's good enough, you know, so somewhere in that band. Um, we had no idea about the performance characteristics of RDMA. And all we knew going into this was like, well, it's, it's, a, it's a hardware offload thing. And we've done hardware offload things before. And in the past, when we've done hardware offload things, what we usually see is we see a minor bump in performance, but a big saving in the amount of CPU time we mm -hmm. spent. You know, and so my, my, the, the original PM spec for faster live migration with RDMA says, you know what? If we can just do live migration on a 10 gigabit connection at normal speed with a 90% reduction in CPU, then success. Like that was the bar we set. Mm. And what we ended up with was the ability to do live migration at hundreds of gigabit per second with zero CPU overhead. You know, as you know, anyone who has tried live migration on RDMA, the performance is mind-blowing. Mm. And, like, we were the first people to have the mind-blowing moment because the first rig that we set up and actually tried this out end-to-end, -end, we were blown away. Yeah. I remember uh, a presentation you did at TechEd, I, I think, 2013, where you first talked about live migration over RDMA with multiple 56 gigabit cards. And yeah, you, absol absolutely. And you said, I have one card on each host and I, I live migrate with nearly 50 gigabit. Then I add another one and I get 100 gigabits and then another 150. And with the force, I also get 150 gigabit. And you asked, yep. what was the story behind that? And 150 gigabit with three, and if you add another one, we have also 150 gigabit. So tell us, what what was the limitation? I find, I I think it's really amazing. Yeah, this this was fascinating, and to to give a little bit more color on this, like working on the live migration with RDMA, we started hitting bottlenecks in the system that we would never have thought were there before. You know, so the the classic one that we hit first was. Uh, in like RDMA is so fast that it's faster than PCIe 2.2. You know, so if you put these in a system that's got PCIe 2.2, you don't get all the speed. You need PCI 3.0. You need all the bandwidth. Um, in this case, it was another mind-blowing moment because you're right. Once we got this up and running, we wanted to see like how fast can we make this. Um, and we added adapters and adapters and adapters. And when we moved from three to four, we saw no improvement. Um, now, thankfully, we have lots of expertise in tooling around performance profiling and so on. So we, we start going in there and put, tearing this apart. And what we find out is that the, when we would got to three RDMA adapters, we were now transferring the virtual machine between the two servers at the speed of memory <laughs> and that adding a fourth adapter we couldn't go faster because you couldn't read or write memory faster in those systems 
And you know, I, I think this is really amazing. Do you know yes. any other hypervisor who can nearly reach that? Because no, no one is using RDMA, not. or? Yes, yeah, yeah. This is something that only Hyper-V has. The thing I like to highlight uh, with that rig that we built, actually two things. The first one is, it was actually not an expensive rig. You know, it was built using white box parts, and you know, it, it was put together by us in our lab, so on. Uh, but the second thing, and I love this fact, is when uh, when we were doing the fastest speed live migration, we were transferring data between those two servers at 16 gigabyte a second. Not gigabit, gigabyte a second uh, going across live migration. So if you'd want to you know, live migrate a 16 gigabyte virtual machine, one second. Great, yeah. A really great feature. I I like that one. So, I have another question for for you, um, and maybe your answer is the same, but I have to ask it anyway. So, what By feature what feature did you think had the biggest impact? What you done? Ah, <sighs> the biggest for Hyper V. So for yeah, for, for Hyper V. Um, Would it be also live migration? I'm just I'm thinking this through because you know, tough ones. Actually, you know, I'm going to give a completely different answer for biggest impact. Okay. And I, I'm going to make I know I'm going to make some people watching cheer when I say this. Um, PowerShell support. Okay, I didn't thought of that, but 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 when okay, I have yeah. to think about the impact, you yeah. Know, the 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 reality is the things I see people doing with Hyper-V today and the sorts of solutions, the sorts of deployments, like the, the, the efficiency, the so on, uh, the impact of PowerShell support has been pretty amazing. Yeah, uh, right. You know, there are, there are I, like, I, would, I would easily argue that half the deployments out there today with Hyper-V would not be successful without the work that happened to have PowerShell and the really easy scripting automation and, and management. Yeah, and there, there is a new feature coming in 2016 that even yes. even improve that PowerShell support. Please tell oh, us, yeah. us about it. Yeah. What is it? This, this one I am really excited about. This is, to me, this is just a cool feature. Um, and this is PowerShell Direct. Yeah. Uh, and this is... This is the ability, you know, and as I said, we've got, we've got PowerShell support for Hyper-V, and it's really easy and, and intuitive to write a PowerShell script that creates a virtual machine, configures a virtual machine, mm -hmm. starts a virtual machine. Um, with PowerShell Direct, um, once you've started that virtual machine from the same script, you can then just jump directly into the virtual machine and start running PowerShell commands against it without having to go through all the pain of setting up networking and remote management and so on. Um, and it is, you know, a, a, little, a little inside story here. You know, I, like a couple of things to, to just kind of explain the world from my perspective. Okay. It's because it's a strange thing working at Microsoft, uh, because like one, there there are many aspects to this. One of the things I point out to people is, I get to spend about one month every two years work uh, using a released version of Windows. Okay. Like Ninety-five percent of my life, I am running on alpha and pre-beta okay. software. Like, my laptop right now is not running the released version of Windows 10. My servers aren't running. Like, I'm running daily builds. I'm running so on. Uh, and sometimes this is lots of fun, and sometimes it's pretty rough. Um, now, all that said, at home, I have a wife and children and a lot of computers, and I don't run pre-release software at home. Okay. You know, so all my home systems are running, you know, right now all my Hyper-V servers at home are running Windows Server 2012 R2. Um, all my desktops are running Windows 10. Like, life is good. And something that I watch out for is in every release that we do, I watch for the moment where 
I get home on a weekend and I'm trying to do something and I get really frustrated because I don't have the feature that we've built in the next release of Windows yet. <laughs> And for me and Hyper-V, PowerShell Direct is that feature. Okay. You know, like, I, it's, like it makes scripting and automation and, of Hyper-V immensely more powerful, immensely simpler. And when I go home and I'm like, wait, I have to build a DHCP server and I can't just run a script in the VM, gah, you know, it's like... And there are so many things where you're like, oh, this is like this is going to be so much easier when we release Windows Server 2016. But um, and, of course, yeah, there will be other features you always. know of and working on you are missing then, right? Always. I, I often tell people that I just basically spend my life angry. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ben. Great examples. I... I didn't thought of PowerShell, but you are so right. I'm I'm working a lot with Hyper-V, you know that, and I use PowerShell all the time. It's, and it's, it's really a lifesaver, and it, it, it yep. makes things so much easier. It's it's really and, great. And PowerShell Direct, great stuff. I can't and wait. You know, yeah. Yeah, what, we, and one of the things I always like to point out to people, and this is, this is going to sound like a sacrilegious thing to say from the Hyper-V guy, uh, is I like to say... The, the reality is no one, you know, present company excluded, no one uses virtual machines for the joy of using virtual machines. Everyone who uses virtual machines has a different goal in mind. You know, you, you don't want a virtual machine. You want a file server. You want a web server. You have a customer problem to solve. Yeah. You know. And once you start looking at it that way, tooling like PowerShell and so on lets you focus on the real problem you want to solve. That's, that's right, yeah. That's right. So, Ben, um, you are working on some great stuff in the moment. 20, yep. 2016 Windows Server is on the horizon, I would say. You talk yep. already at Ignite about great features. So, I want to ask you what is the most important thing you think, or for you at least, many features are important, of course, but which, which features do you think are most important in the 2016 release that, will, that are new or will change many things? So I, I want to give two answers to this question. Okay. Because there's, there's kind of a short-term answer and a long-term answer. And actually, short-term is the wrong, an immediate answer and, uh, and a long-term answer. Okay. So the immediate answer, when I look at the 2016 release, what I'm most excited about, um, what, what, you know, what I think is going to be the biggest impact for our customers, and is absolutely Nano Server. Okay. You know, um, and we've been doing a huge amount of work to get both as a company to get Nano Server to market and the Hyper-V team to have an awesome experience with running Hyper-V on Nano and running Nano in Hyper-V. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting because, you know, for people who haven't played with Nano Server, let me just do the quick rundown. You know, this is a very stripped down, special purpose deployment of Windows. Um, you know, it's designed to just run the... the only the, the things you want on your server. So for a Hyper-V on Nano Server deployment, we're talking about a 500 meg disk footprint. Um, it is just the bits you want for running Hyper-V. Um, and the, the challenge, and we're aware of this, is we are, as humans, we are creatures of comfort. Um, <laughs> yes. And people actually kind of like all the other stuff that's around. You know, they like having the desktop and the tooling and so on. With Nano Server, we're saying like, no, it's remote management. You know, it's you, you deploy it on your server and then you go and manage it remotely because you don't want all that tooling and so on. Uh, and there's going to be some some struggle getting through that. But the upsides, you know, the the increased security of Nano, the reduced number of times you have to patch it. Frankly, the reduced number of things that can go wrong. Um, 
you know, the, the, and the, the great thing about Nano is uh, we are working hard, so we want customers to be able to take their existing infrastructures, their existing deployments, and just drop in Hyper-V on Nano server and make everything better. Okay. You know, that's, 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 that's the goal. So that's, that's a that's big my, goal, right? Yeah. You, know, <laughs> you don't work at Microsoft if you don't have big goals. Okay, I will uh, remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's for me that's the most immediate thing you know when I'm talking to to customers and IT pros and I'm talking about like you know in the first 12 months after you deploy 2016 where are you going to see the the biggest bang for the buck as it were it's definitely nano now switching to the other end of the spectrum is the work we're doing on Windows containers and Hyper-V containers um, and for me, this is this is super exciting. It's like it, it brings a whole lot of potential, you know. And you know, I talked about you know PowerShell having the impact that it did because it you know moved the usability and the 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 control bar. You know, uh, containers take that to a whole new level. Um, at the same time, though, there's a reason why I put it in a different category to nano, and that is this is such a new technology that, I, honestly, I don't expect that people are going to be deploying containers in mass the day we RTM 2016. No, like it's going to take us a while as an industry and together to figure out like how to, to use containers well and how to get the value yeah. out. Uh, but you know, if I if I if I look into my crystal ball and say, of all the stuff we do in 2016, what will have had what will have the biggest impact on the world 10 years from today? My bet, my my call is containers. Okay, it is why because of the different model of developing that you can do or delivering a software or why would you say it's it's the biggest impact in so the the thing that that I find fascinating like there are so many conversations happening right now inside the development team and with customers where you know when we started on containers we were like oh this is a neat new way to do virtualization and so on and then, like as we're we're going down the road and working on them, there are so many fundamentals that we're revisiting that it's it's frankly mind blowing, you know. So to to step through uh, three examples um, the, of recent conversations, um, the the first example, and I, I talked about this recently at Tech at New Zealand. Um, is, you know, I had, a, I had a room full of IT pros and guys who are, are familiar with Hyper-V and virtual machines and so on. And I stood there and said, like, okay, like, we know how to do this. We know how to, we know how to do private cloud properly. Uh, like, if you're a, a good IT pro and you wanted to do an elastic private cloud properly, uh, you would start by saying, okay, the first thing I need is I need a golden image. So uh, I'm going to create a virtual machine, I'm going to install Windows, I'm going to get all the patches, I'm going to apply the policies for my company, I'm going to ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba, and then I'm going to sysprep it, and I'm going to shut it down, and that's then my golden image. And yeah. then, once I've done that, um, well, one of, the, one of the, the, the templates I want to provide in my infrastructure is a SQL Server. So I'm going to create a differencing disk, I'm going to start it up, I'm going to install SQL, I'm going to patch it, I'm going to, and I'm going to generalize it, and I'm going to, and then I'm going to sysprep that, I'm going to shut that down, and then I've now got my golden image, I've got my, my template, and so on. And the, the reality is, if you are good, and I mean really good, like that only took you four days. Okay. <laughs> that's that's yeah, the reality. Yeah, yeah, you know, and for, for most people, that took you two weeks. You know, that's the bullpark. And then on stage using containers, I did that in two minutes. Okay, can't wait to see that. You know, I, on created, yeah. Yeah, I created a container. I installed my server. I captured an image. Look, that's a base image. Now I can create new containers. Yeah. I like just so simple and like when you talk about efficiencies of going from days to minutes like you cannot imagine that that's not going to change the way people do things okay um, 
So that's that's one example. The the next example has been that like yes, you know, we start looking at you know, and for a long time we've been talking about things like hey, we want to enable hybrid cloud, and hey, we want to you know be able to move things between public and private cloud, and one of the things that's always been on the mind of the industry uh, is a concept called cloud bursting. And the idea of cloud bursting is, I want to I want to run everything on my private cloud, and life's good. And if things get hot, then I want to burst up to a public cloud to handle the workload. It, it's it's a great concept to draw on a whiteboard, um, until you stop and you go, wait a second, what you just said is. When the load gets high enough for my private cloud to be struggling, at that point in time, I want to try and upload a 50 gigabyte virtual machine to a public cloud. Mm -hmm. I'm like, ah, no, <laughs> that's not going to work. Um, now, when we look at containers, that might actually work, because a great example, and I've been, I've been playing with my own infrastructure with this so that I can start throwing these numbers around. I run a Minecraft server in my house for me and my kids to play on. Um, and it's a Minecraft server for those unfamiliar. It's actually, it's basically a Java web, a Java database is, okay. is what you're running. You know, it's a Java engine and it's a database that keeps track of the world and, and so on. And it's actually a pretty good, you know, workload for a server app workload. Um, when I run that in a virtual machine, my Minecraft server virtual machine takes up 30 gig of disk. Okay. You know, could I cloud burst that under demand? No. 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 When I take that same workload and I stick it in a container, and by the way, when I stick it in a container, my kids don't notice the difference. It still looks and feels like a Minecraft server, so on. The size on disk of that Minecraft server is now 200 meg. That's quite a different. Yeah. Uh, could I cloud? Yeah. Could I cloud burst that? Yes, actually. Yes. Yeah. Like, like it would take me two minutes to be like, you know what? Let's shut down the server, move it up to Azure, and run it there. Uh, and so that's another one where we go. Like, okay, this is going to change the world. The final one, and I love this because, you know, and I said three examples. This I love the most because I've had this conversation one-on-one -on -one with a number of IT pros now. And, you know, you can see, like, you can see that this conversation hurts their head. <laughs> and, and, I, and I love that. Uh, I, I'll have people with a virtual machine background starting to look at containers, and they'll come to me and they'll say, "Hey, hey Ben, we've been we've been playing with this, and we're trying to figure out how can we do like offline editing of the container image. How can we do offline installation of apps and offline composition?" And my immediate answer is, "You can't." And okay. and they look at me like. Oh dear, Ben has lost grip of his senses. Uh, and then I say, but if you can, like, like, stop and think about it. If you can start a container in seconds, and if running a container uses a minuscule amount of memory and a minuscule amount of CPU, and you can exit a container easily, why do you need to edit offline? Yeah. Uh, you know, that's some truth like, in it, yeah. And that's like that's an interesting mind shift. There's a whole bunch of technology and tooling that we've built up to work around the shortcomings of our current systems. And containers are actually opening up some entirely new potentials. Mm. So when I kind of look at this landscape, like there's still a huge lot of unknowns, a lot of stuff we're trying to figure out. But you know, as I said, when I go like. What do I think has the most potential to have like made a change in the landscape in 10 years' time? I'm saying containers. Okay, I get it. I will think about that uh, because it's also <laughs> a mind shift for me. You know, I'm yep. a Hyper-V MVP, used to virtual machines, and now we have to think around that. Hey, and there is a question the, I have. I was just about to say, the, the, the little secret is 
it's a mind shift for us as well. We just get a six month start on everyone else. Okay. So we get to walk around like, yeah, we got this down. And it's like, we figured this out three months ago. Okay, so <laughs> that's a question. You mentioned there is an, a con Windows container and there is a Hyper-V container. Yes. So the question yes. is, what is the difference and where, why are they two? So uh, if you look at the, the two container technologies, uh, so we we're building Windows containers, and Windows containers are what most people think of when they think of container technology in general. Um, it's giving you isolated, sep like separate system identity, but just built on top of the Windows kernel. Okay. Uh, and this this has a lot of nice properties. You know, you you will be able to run Windows containers anywhere. You know, and one of the things that we've been very explicit about is we want, like, yes, we want you to be able to run Windows containers on Microsoft private clouds, and yes, we want you to be able to run Windows containers on Azure, obviously. Uh, we also want you to be able to run Windows containers on your VMware cloud. We want you to be able to run Windows containers on Amazon. Okay. Anywhere that you can run Windows, you'll be able to run Windows containers. Okay. Um, and, in fact, we did... Um, we did the, the first public preview of Windows containers, and a week later I had a blog post on Virtual PC Guy saying, here's how you set up Windows containers in VirtualBox. So if you want to run Windows containers on your Mac, party on. Like install VirtualBox, follow these steps, and away you go. Uh, Hyper-V containers are then about taking the experience taking the tooling, taking all the capabilities of Windows containers and bringing hypervisor level isolation and security. You know, and this is something that you're only going to be able to do this on Microsoft platforms. But you know, we believe that like, containers are great when you're running internally and so on, but when it comes time to go live on a multi-tenant, cloud fabric, then you want to have the level of isolation that you get from virtual machines. And one of the big things that we're working hard on, and now in disclosure, we have not released a public preview of Hyper-V containers yet, and the reason for that is we're still working on them. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait we're, to see them. We're, we're madly working on them right now, um, but one of the big goals that we have is we want there to be zero friction going between Windows containers and Hyper-V containers. We want the difference from, for the end user, the difference between these two things should just be, did you check the, I want this to be hypervisor isolated box. You know, so we want someone to be able to work with Windows containers, you know, be like working on their Mac laptop or whatever, and then when they're done, give it to the guy who runs their Microsoft Cloud and say, you know, go live with this. And the, 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 the guy who runs the cloud can then be like, you know what? We're going to turn on hypervisor isolation. Um, and it, it won't have any effects other than just raising the, the bar of isolation and security. Great answer. I, now this concept is, uh, is more clear to me because I was always thinking, why are they two? And you clarified that. So uh, respecting your time, we have only three minutes left. I have one yes. last question for you. Uh, this never, time, never enough time, time for us. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when you think of the technology, that technology program, whatever, that most impact you and it has nothing to do with the work. So what would it be? Ah, uh, this is this is actually really easy. Okay. Um, and this is because this is an answer that surprises everyone, um, even the people who worked on the technology in question. Um, so the the answer would be uh, Windows speech recognition. Okay. Uh, because oh, I know why. Okay. You, you know why? You've heard this story. Let me give the, the quick rundown. So I work as a program manager at Microsoft, have been for the last, you know, 12, 13 years. And my job is writing specs and writing email and, and working with developers and so on. And uh, in 2008, um, I had a medical issue which effectively stopped me from being able to use my arms at all. Just at all. I could not I could not drive a car. I could not 
I could not pick up a cup of coffee. Um, I certainly could not use a keyboard or a mouse at all. And uh, it, was a, it was a long, long process. It was actually two years before I got full use of my arms back, and thankfully they're working today, and I'm happy with that. Uh, but for two years, I did my day job using nothing but the voice recognition uh, built into Windows. Um, and that was an amazing experience. Um, and so for me, that is definitely the technology that's had the biggest impact on me. Okay, great uh, ending for the podcast. Yeah. Ben, I want to thank you. This was a great podcast for me. I like the stories you tell, you, you told here, uh, a lot of insight. And I wish you a nice day in Redmond. And we, I think we see you at the end of October at WIM1. And uh, I'm looking forward yep. to that. Yeah, so, lots, of, lots of stuff going on this year. It's an exciting time. And then there's the MVP Summit. See you yep. there. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Wasn't that a great interview? Thanks so much, Ben, for sharing all the information with us. This was the first episode of the Hyper-V Amigos uh, podcast, and many will follow, I hope at least, and I hope you enjoyed it. Check out the show notes for other stuff I'm doing, the other podcasts, the video casts, and the interviews. And I hope I see you soon on this podcast again. Bye-bye from Carsten Rachfall. Ciao!